Welcome, everyone, um, to the third LSC Open Conversation. And this is a series of conversations uh, engaging with architects and, and academics and members of that surrounding community uh, that we've been convening since May of 2020. Um, we'd like to use these opportunities to capture the questions and thoughts at this moment and looking forward in higher education uh, uh, and learning spaces more generally um, and incorporate these conversations in these sessions into the LSC Library of Evidence, uh, which will inform the work starting this fall on the next edition of the LSC Spaces That Work Thought Leadership. We've been having um, serious discussions within our LSC group uh, of about 35 and wanted to open the conversation more broadly. Uh, and so it's a real treat and I thank you all for, for joining us. This is an opportunity um, to share as a community uh, the questions we are all pursuing today. I want to encourage the use of the chat in this Zoom session to submit questions, to comments and plus ones and ideas, to share resources. Uh, I intend to do the same. Uh, I am uh, one of Park Roads. I am one of the uh, uh, facilitators of this conversation. Um, I'm going to kick off the introductions. I'll start with myself. Uh, who am I? Uh, and my organization role. I'm Park Rhodes. I am Principal of Vantage Technology Consulting Group. I identify as a technologist, an academic technologist and a futurist uh, working in a largely consulting to learning space stakeholders like architects in higher ed institutions. Um, let's go with uh, Mark. Do you want to Sure. I'm uh, Mark Kolozinski. I'm the Associate Director for Academic Technology for Oregon State University and the Technical Services Group. Uh, primarily do a lot of consulting and design work for the teaching and learning spaces at the university. Uh, I basically define myself as the AV diplomat, trying to find solutions for physical spaces to solve problems around the university and the state. Uh, Larry? Sure. Um, I'm Larry Darling. I am the Classroom Technology Manager at UNC Greensboro, uh, very, and I have a job very, very similar to Mark, where I consult, design, support all the learning spaces across campus. Christopher? Uh, my name is Chris Dechter. I'm, uh, I guess I, I will say I'm erstwhile principal learning space engineer at Indian University as of last Friday. Uh, in a week or so, I will be the manager of instructional technology at University of Wyoming. So I'm kind of in an interim position here of doing nothing. Um, but my role at, at IU was much like Mark and Larry have described. It's, it's, it's working with departments to find learning space solutions. And specifically at IU, I did a lot of kind of unusual spaces that didn't fall into normal uh, categories of a standard classroom or conference room it was a lot of kind of oddball requests and how do we make things happen for um, for departments who had kind of a very specific vision uh, and, and how do we make that a successful learning space. Julie? Hi, I'm Julie Johnston. I'm the Acting Associate Vice President for Learning Technologies at Indiana University, as well as the Director of Learning Spaces and worked collaboratively with Chris, who you just met, who we're excited that he's getting a new opportunity uh, for growth. But yes, uh, we, we design a lot of different unique spaces and we, we have a lot of fun doing it. We, it's our passion. Uh, we believe that we're designing intentionally. Um, I, in, in addition, I sit on the Educause Learning Space Rating System team, and as well, we, we just launched a 3.0, the Learning Space Rating System. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, which I'm guessing most of you have if you're here in the room. Thank you. Uh, Julie, do you want to kick this off and you, as our fearless leader? Absolutely. I am the moderator of this session, and I'm happy to kind of uh, facilitate the conversations. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a topic that uh, a lot of us have been um, working with this past year, as well as now, what are we going to do moving forward? And so the question is, what have we learned about how and where virtual learning happens? And what's next? What worked? And what are we carrying forward? So that's uh, the question at hand of, you know, where are we? What worked? What are we, what are we going to carry forward? And so I'm just going to leave it out there for, for you all to interject if someone of the facilitators wants to start with, where are we? I'll jump in. I'll go for it. So, right. Thank you, so Mark. We, we did a lot of deployment. We did a lot. I'm sure a lot of people that were working in technology put a lot of technology out there. And we, we jokingly said that we did a lot of 
quantitative <laughs> configurations, getting stuff out there to treat analog spaces and to facilitate and create the opportunity to have virtualized learning environments. And I'm not sure what all the other universities are doing or not, but we're kind of getting ready for the big push, right? People are going to come back into these spaces. And now we're really focusing on the engagement. And so now we get into that qualitative, how are we using the technologies well? How are we looking and, and actually teaching in the space as well? Um, where first we had reacted, did a lot of deployment, did a lot of assessment and did those pieces. But now we're really focusing on that faculty side. What does that mean? And so how do we make sure that our faculty make the best use of these spaces? And that is kind of what we're up against now. Um, I think we had a very simple, simple, it's like, get this stuff digitized, get it out into the digital world. But now how do we do it the best way possible? I think Chris and Larry, we kind of talked about this a lot. So I'll let you guys jump in. Yeah, we were in a very similar space that I started at UNCG about half a year before the pandemic hit. And up until that time, they really didn't have a, co a cohesive plan for putting UCC into all the classroom spaces. And so we really had to do a quantity above quality when we launched. Uh, and so we had multiple versions of upgrades that we did. And some of them were basically capturing the instructor, which is not the ideal way to virtualize a learning environment. You're missing out on so much of the interaction. And so I, I went ahead and I made sure that every building had at least one or two spaces that were done the correct way and a better way. But now that we have, we're back open to business, all of our instructors are coming back, we have to go back and address some more spaces and then also make sure that the instructors that do have more discussion-based pedagogy and more of that aspect in their teaching and learning are in the correct spaces for them. I, I, I want to bring up the, the, uh, the point in the, the question that, that Julie posed or kind of our, our topic of discussion today. It's about virtual learning, which is something that a term we all now use and throw around very freely. And this is a term that if you would mention to any one of us two years ago, we would have said, well, what do you mean by that? You mean like taking an online course or do you mm -hmm. mean like correspondence or do you mean doing an, you know, an asynchronous or synchronous online? You know, how are we? Whereas now that that is the model moving forward, whether or not the, the instructors are, are planning for their spaces, whether or not the students are ready for it, all courses, at least all spaces have to be able to support some semblance of this of virtual learning of this mixed modal delivery uh, environment. Because as Mark mentioned, we don't know necessarily what uh, um, what, how people are going to adapt to this, what they're going to do, what, what this transition is going to be like. Mark, I'm going to steal your term right now. Take we're going it. to have to wait a year to really find out how, what, you know, how, how we plan for this, what was successful, what wasn't. But I think we have nuggets of ideas based on the last, this last kind of weird year, I guess we want to call it that. Because it, uh, like many of you at IU, we were on campus. We were there the whole time. We were not closed while campus population was very strange and there was you know what maybe 25 percent of what you would normally expect there were still classes happening and we've leveraged that opportunity uh to see did these these quantity over quality deployments that mark mentioned and larry mentioned that we got as many basic cameras and microphone systems out there as possible was that what people needed and i think we found that eh, i mean that's the minimum that's the base of what you need but it's not necessarily uh solving everyone's everyone's um needs there and i think the most important thing is it doesn't really address the student needs at all i mean we we did everything we can to say okay well if we can get the front of the room if we can get that instructor view or the, the instructor kind of shown online that's that's maybe that's step one or maybe that's step one half um but you have all these students who are now participating how do we make sure they're engaged how do we make sure that they're involved in their classes because at best case, maybe there's a monitor at the back of the room and you put up the big Zoom Brady Bunch view and they're all kind of in there uh, as little squares. It, you know, I can't see them. I can't really tell what's going on in there. I can't, I can't visually read their, their facial expressions. Are they participating? Um, yes, they may be physically attending, but are they participating? Uh, and that's a challenge. Um, there are any number of technologies to address that. And, and I find it interesting. Some of the projects I worked on at IU were conceived of prior to the pandemic, and they're still kind of going through the process because it is a longer process to design an entire new learning space from the ground up. 
but with the idea of how do you engage students who are, are remote and let them be in charge of the content and let them be in charge of what they're seeing and give them that same flexibility they'd have if they were sitting in a room. Um, that's a very specialized space. And we won't know long-term was that successful for another year or so post that. But we do have a lot of other spaces that are functionally still the traditional classroom. And there's five, six, seven hundred 700 of them with now better cameras and microphones and better technologies. Is that going to address that need? And I think we sure hope so. And I think we're confident that it will. And it certainly adds a, like Larry mentioned, a lot of rooms have, or all the rooms have some basic capability, but a couple of rooms have really good capability to really make this an engaging learning space. Um, so fingers crossed that, that that works out and that, uh, that um, is a successful transition for people this fall. I think, I think the one thing that we've seen that has changed radically is just the lexicon and the language around what's happening, right? When things, and we have some agreement on what's, what is being called what, but I think there's some opportunity there to kind of create some standards around experience. Um, but being really intentional about what it is we're doing and what that modality is and what are the outcomes and experiences, uh, because I still think there's some lag in, you know, faculty coming and being in a dual environment um, at home, at your table, at your, you know, your, your dining room is one experience. However, there's going to be a, an overwhelming group of folks that are going to come back to campus and think I'm just going to do that same thing in a classroom. And that is unpacking that and understanding the, the nuance that's needed to address people who may be there in your actual local room with you. And then the people outside of that and in designing for that and like the stuff is kind of the easy part, right? The, the, the hardware and the configurations of the room, but are we working within the faculty development to, to make sure that we're giving oxygen to those students who are not in that space with us to engage them? Yeah. Um, and, it, and I think that's really important. And I, I haven't seen a lot of emphasis put on that, but those who do it well will, will come forward and, and they're going to be the champions in this. But, you know, us as technology kind of facilitators and, and working with them, we can give them those tools, but we, we really need to understand like what is that pedagogical design going to be and how are they going to make the best use of these new environments to deliver this mixed modality? Uh, because if you just do the same old thing you did, whether it's at home or what you did prior to the pandemic, it's not going to serve both those very well. Um, we we've, we've did the best we could treating physical spaces, um, but now we're, like, we really need to be very intentional about how people make the best use of these new spaces. Yeah, and I think what Chris and Mark were saying about getting the feedback and it taking a year is really relevant because most of the time when we des design a new learning space, we go through a needs analysis. We go through all this to try to understand how the instructors want to use the space. The instructors were off campus when we did all of this work. And so we had to make some assumptions. And this year, we'll find out how those assumptions went and we'll modify and we'll improve, but it's still going, it's going to be a learning process. Yeah, I, I will say we, so, you know, big, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying that, you know, um, pulling back from this and trying to take the, the planning perspective, um, I, I, there are a couple of things that seem to be you know, always rising to surface or always rising to surface, meaning like the past two weeks. Um, and I heard it here a lot of times that, that one, this is not what any one of us would have considered well-crafted virtual learning or remote learning two years ago. This response to a pandemic is emergency response teaching. And so what happened is not necessarily what's going to happen next. There's going to be maybe a short term and a long term. And, and uh, so, you know, short term, we're going to try and take this and deploy it. And we're going to focus on things like equity and the experience, right, as we go into, because it's not going to be a hard, it was a hard switch, cut of the switch over, but it's not going to be a hard cut of the switch back to whatever back is going to be. Um, and back is not going to be what it was, because I think one of the things that we are all also experiencing is this moment has brought to us a massive change in the adoption rate which was always the challenge. You know, everyone understood the traditional role of the traditional campus in face-to-face -face instruction. And there was this resistance, maybe not for any other reason other than unfamiliarity with the tools that might deliver learning outside of the classroom or might make a permeable layer between the walls of a classroom and other instruction. We now have accomplished, no one wanted it this way, a massive adoption rate. So in the long term, it's probably coming back and looking at these tools as an adoption rate and saying, we are in a new era. What do we want to keep from before? What do we want to toss? 
and make sure that we don't lose and and what do we need to create a new and on that i think we're talking about the equity and that in order to accomplish and pull this off we need to do and build differently and you're all we're all working on we all had to rush ahead on the build part now it's time to really think about what we do differently to to reach this new long-term future is that yeah i think you're you're summing that up really well and I think from a tactical standpoint, you know, the, the shift we, we've seen was once this type of technology was seen as a premium, right? And now it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And so the cost point came down. We have it. It's, it's out there. And we did that really fast. And people didn't expect it. So now people are walking in. And so what's going to happen now? And, you know, who, do, who does it well? Who doesn't do it well? And where are the opportunities for folks? Park, to your point on the 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 speed at which this happened. I think we've discussed this a couple of times and the the phrase I've used in the past is six months and or six years and six months. So it, we, we basically got shoved forward, not in any way that we would have liked to have done it, but you know, and then to, to your point, I think we cut a lot of corners. Um, uh, we, we, we did a lot of things that ordinarily we would not do. If you said, hey, you've got a year to design these new spaces, how would you do it? Well, there's a very kind of regimented process for that. It's like, if you have 90 days to, to apply as much as you can, we're going to do things in a lot of kind of slapdash ways because we need to get that quantity out there. Uh, now, as we go back and look at that, um, it's it's this reflection on as as Mark just mentioned, it was it was a premium, but now it's it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Uh, it used to be the the kind of a, an add on or maybe a, a, a if we have time in the budget or or, or t you know funds in the budget or time in in the project, then yeah, let's add some video conference capability to our system. But now it's like no, that's where you start. Um, and so back to the, the idea of this six years and six months, I think it, it, we would normally on a, on a normal scale in 2018, 2019, we'd figure to get to where we are now, it's going to take about six years of kind of progressive use of this sort of technology before it really becomes pervasive, by which I mean students expect it in every class, instructors expect it, expect it in every space. And to Mark's point, whether that space is in a, a physical classroom building or if it's in my dining room, I need to be able to teach this way. But we got moved forward in about six months, um, and I think everybody was recognizing the the severity and the unusual situation. Cut everyone else a lot of slack that oh, this didn't work quite as well as I wanted, or this is awkward, or this is tough to do. But but now it's been you know a year past that, so we've had a full academic year in this sort of scenario. And as people are transitioning back to campus, because I think we're all trying to push for this kind of return to normalcy, whatever that might be. And your point is 100% valid, Park, that it's not going to go back exactly the way it was. We're going to take some things from this experience, but we can build on that. But we want that that experience of being together and in, in, in that, that community experience in a, in a campus. Um, but it's it's going to be a, a different sort of transition back for that as well. And so it, it does raise these questions. Uh, how do we start to look at the, the, the for example, equity? Uh, the, the big thing that I've been pushing for a lot is, is this idea of students approach the, the material that's being presented to them differently. And I, Mark and Larry and I have talked about this quite a bit. Like we still have spaces where there's a big screen and I can show you one thing at a time. And if, if I simply move that online, I can now show everybody online and everybody in the room this one thing. And everyone has to look at this one thing I'm showing you. And when we're done with that, we'll move to the next thing. Well, now you can't go back and ever see that. What if I'm in the room and we go back to learning spaces 10, 12, 15 years ago, and I'm writing across the marker board, the whiteboard, the chalkboard, whatever that writing surface is, if you're now doing something on the other side of the room, I can go back and look at what was over there um, because I just turned my head and there it is. And so that's the way students would, would, uh, would absorb the information. Or if I want to look something up in the book while you're talking, I can do that. But now if I'm watching one screen and I can see one piece of content, uh, my, my in-class experience is now driven by you solely. I have no, uh, no, no say in that. I'm just kind of along for the ride. And hopefully through visual cues and, and interaction with students online and in the space, we're all kind of moving at the right pace and absorbing the information. So one of the challenges that, that we've been envisioning recently is how do we separate content from that dedicated content stream, isolate it and make it available all the time, thus putting students in charge 
and giving them the option to select what content they're viewing at any given time. So if I need more time to go back and look at those notes, if I need more time to, to see those slides that were up there, or if I need more time to, to look at what was written on the marker board that I've then, you know, we've captured as well as we talked about this implementation of newer technologies, we can grab that, put that into, virtualize it, put it into the, the online delivery methods. If I need more time with that, I'm in charge of that, even though the class is moving on. So instead of having this one stream of teaching throughout a um, uh, you know class of 50 students, you have potentially 50 streams of all the students kind of moving at their own pace, but they're all kind of part of that conversation. So that's the hope anyway, with some of these new technologies. Let me rephrase. Some of these very ubiquitous and existing technologies being applied in new ways in our learning spaces that will make it that much more equitable for students who need to operate at slightly different, uh, you know, uh, different speeds of, of content um, uh, delivery and, and, and absorption. So they are, they're the ones in charge of what's being, what's being taught in the class that day. So they can kind of go work with what works best with them, I guess. And we've talked about quantity versus quality. And what Chris has described is the ideal situation. The challenge is that solution is much harder to scale at this point. Like we can do it, but the entry fee for that is a barrier for for a lot of universities to have that as the standard. But I think, I mean, what I'm hearing though is that uh, this group I think is always really, we as technologists are always thinking about the application, yeah. which is inherently the answer to the question. But we are, as technologists in this moment, we are maybe the early, the canaries hearing the questions first. And I third, you know, there's a whole bunch of those that we're all, that I'm facing now. I, I don't know about you. Um, are there sort of how do I dot, dot, dot. And so Christopher brought up a really good one. How do I maintain that, that you know, pervasive information so that we, how do I stay in control as a student of the flow of information so I can go back and forward in time? Um, I think it was, I, uh, maybe it was all three of you, Larry, uh, Mark, and Christopher, who talked about how do I, what was it, uh, separate out all the different uh, screens notionally. You know, if we were to have a PowerPoint up here, we'd all be squished over to the side and we'd all be looking at one screen. But in a classroom, you know, how do we then start to think about the walls? What are some of those other how do I things that you were, you were thinking of and coming, coming up with? So I think one, one of the things that, I see a lot of, and then is, is the element of time, right? In, in a classroom with no virtualized component, we're all sharing the same space at the same time. Somebody who's distant and not in that room with us, they can't share the same space at the same time with us, right? They're, they're all, it's much more linear. We're in a space, we can have overlapping conversations. You can hear students next to you. You can talk to somebody next to you. You can say, hey, I didn't get this, didn't get that. So it's an access thing. So, right, so how do we balance access to students to have the full enriched student experience if they cannot be in that space? So how do we develop and allow people the ability to have communication channels through that? And, you know, we've talked about it radically, like what is there, do we have spaces that don't have technology that actually are more immersive because people are just bringing their own laptops and stuff in those rooms and they're connected and we're kind of like the together alone philosophy where we're all in the, a common virtualized environment, but maybe there's not a big screen. Maybe there's not all this other stuff. It's just a very well-treated Wi-Fi infrastructure, things like to kind of create a better overall experience for everybody through that, that modality. And, I, you know, things we're kind of thinking about challenging, how do I, how do I kind of deliver that and, and break down the time barrier and allow more communications from different students and student to student, which is taking place, but not really in that physical environment. So how do you get your arms around that and really understand from a faculty perspective, you know, back channel communications, how does that kind of play into your curriculum design? What does that mean from a space and time and network? And so it, it's really interesting because it's, there's a lot to figure out that we don't even see in the physical realm that we're trying to get our arms around. So I would like to talk a little bit about informal spaces and I have a, a couple of other comments too. So uh, this, this new challenge of ours is that what do our informal spaces need now versus what they needed in the past? So for example, the student's life is different. Uh, we may have a student on campus for a class, but then they have to jump onto a, a fully online class. And that, that wasn't the case before. There's just more online offerings. And so our spaces in the informal settings need to address this. We need to have enough of them, sufficient amount of space so that students 
uh, have the ability to jump uh, into one of those spaces for their courses, as well as what do outdoor spaces need now? Um, before on our campus, we have them, but are we, do we need to be more intentional? Uh, do we need a variety? Is it part of the campus master plan now that maybe it wasn't before in terms of really treating them as learning spaces, not just touchdown spaces? Can, can yeah. I just point out how exceptional that is that, that um, uh, I used to say that as almost a provocative thing that, you know, what if there's a point in the future when the technologist is taught or that, you know, the, the ITAB people are commenting on the outdoor space and everyone would just laugh at it. And we are now there. This is we now, are there. We are there. I think it, it, you're seeing that it, it's widely accepted that teaching and learning is not stopping at the traditional four walls. And it, it is expected with any new space that there's a fair amount of informal teaching and learning space surrounding all of those traditional spaces. And kind of going back to things that we look for in successful informal spaces, if we all here have traveled, right? Think of the best airport terminal you've been in. Like then that's when I look out in front of classes in formal spaces, I, and I'm seeing airport terminals and that like, what is that infrastructure? If you're going to be somewhere and you're not necessarily in that class and maybe you have an hour or two before your next class at your next flight, you're going to catch, you want somewhere you have all your BYOD, right? You want to do that. You want to be able to have a, a a good area to go to. So we want to have it well thought out, but we're supporting students in that experience, right? It's not necessarily, you know, giving them special access to one of these things and things we took for granted, like simple charging things go a long way now with all the stuff we have, but also comfort, right? You know, nobody likes to have the plastic hard seat out in, in the weird, weird area, the repurposed thing from the surplus. Like there, there's, how do we make sure that the, the student experience doesn't stop at the four walls of the classroom. It needs to extend out the outside spaces, the informal spaces between classes. And, and we should definitely keep an eye on that. We have robust infrastructure, Wi-Fi, things like that, that is there to support that experience as students come and go. And we probably need to consider virtual informal spaces as well, because a large portion of our class might not be in the area and they're really missing out on that rich relationship learning and experience that that happens and we need to find a way of creating opportunities for that outside of just the physical class and larry we, we've talked about that exact point recently the, the three of us anyway um with this idea that students create their own communication channels that continue before after and during class they you know it's it's We'd like to all say, oh, yes, they go in and use the official chat room in the online course for the, for the, no, no, they, they create a Slack channel, they create a WhatsApp group, they, whatever is easiest for them, what is lowest friction for them, it works on their phone, works on their computer, works on wherever they are, they can do it at work, they do it at home, you know, they do it out and about, because it, it, that's the way they live their lives, um, and, and communication is ubiquitous connectivity is ubiquitous, uh, and I think we need to plan for that and, 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 and allow for that, but it's, it's how do we, how do we, uh, I, I, I think so much of what we try to do from an, from an IT standpoint is we, well, we, we create you a, a, here's a, a provided and supported, um, you know, methodology for communication or some sort of technology or something, whether it's, you know, it's an online delivery or, or, or whatever it might be, please use this. If you're not using this, we can't support you. But now the, the request, the, the, the challenge is going to be, how do we support all these, kind of informal ad hoc little systems that, that students are using because it's easy for them and it makes sense for them. It fits into their world. Uh, and and it's it's this kind of idea of these, I like the idea of these informal learning spaces that are, are virtual. Uh, it's it's going to happen. If, it's, if I'm having a conversation with six other people in my course um, on Tuesday afternoon for our, our class the next day, that's just as valid as as six of us sitting in one of these lounges that Mark was describing that have the nice chairs and the and the good Wi-Fi. That's just as valid as us having that conversation there. The, the 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 information is being disseminated. The communication is happening. How do we support that? And it's it, frankly, it's by well, if if it's you know the, the good news from a technology standpoint, if it's a, if it's some sort of web-based or cloud-based system, that's easy to support. But you know, if someone says, I can't connect to it today, we need files in here, how do I really get there? Well, that's going to become kind of part of our bailiwick to, to own that and provide some level, some semblance of, of technical support for that. Um, and it's the same thing with these informal spaces. We're going to provide, here are gathering spaces around campus that, you know, we just kind of sprinkle them around, but now it's going to be kind of assumed they're going to be everywhere. I come out of my class and I'm going to sit down with a couple people or I'm going to join because I got there 20 minutes early or to the outdoor scenarios. The weather's nice today. Let's go outside. Do we have good Wi-Fi? Is there power nearby? Because 
I've never seen a student's phone that's anywhere above about 40%. They're always kind of almost on the way out. Um, so we have to provide that level of, of connectivity, infrastructure, technology, but how do we support that if the, if the learning is now taking place out there? We have to be able to respond from, I'm not in University Hall room 100, I'm in the green space between University Hall and the pavilion, and there's six of us out here at this little concrete space, and we can't get a good Wi-Fi. You know, we're going to have to start responding to those. So it's going to be a real challenge from a support standpoint, because all this kind of additional ubiquitous use of informal learning is coming. It's going to be driven by the students. It's not driven by IT. It's not driven by the instructors. It's not driven by administration. It's the students who are going to do it because they're going to force it because that's how they learn. That's what makes sense to them. And they're going to want to bring that with them to their learning space, whether it's virtual or physical, because it's, it's how they live their lives. And so it's going to be a, a real challenge. I have an interesting story about uh, what student expectations are versus the reality. So, for example, and Chris is mentioning the pervasive wireless, outdoor wireless, and we all have a little uh, pockets of it, but uh, we aren't fully wireless across the entire university yet. Now, now we will be. That's in the conversations. However, we received a call from a student um, that was studying in, with a group in what we call Dunmeadow. And they said, well, the wireless isn't picking up. Uh, there must be a problem. No, it's because there isn't wireless, but that's what they expect. We, we have to get there. We have, this is what they, they didn't even assume that we wouldn't have it. And so uh, getting to the point where we're providing what students expect uh, is, is where we, we, we truly need to head. Outdoor wireless, maybe in the um, text chat, you could start um, putting some, some of them. If, if someone wants to, to go with one, but put in your ideas, what would you, what would you want? What would you hire? I love that, Jeannie. Yeah. What, what space are you going to hire based on the characteristics it has? And I don't know if any of your organizations are kind of going through the same homework right now, that this concept of hoteling, right? And, and then folks who may not be working on campus or full-time, where do they go? They don't necessarily need to have a full office, but what infrastructure do they need access to when they are on campus and they are working? So, you know, it, somebody put in the chat, like the WeWork scenario. So think about that. What, what infrastructure access do students need? What kind of security pieces do they need? What do we need to provide that allow them to have success? And, um, but at the same time that we're not isolating, Right, we want to make sure that we're actually bringing them in and, make, and making that a part of the experience, not just kind of a, a closed space around the corner, go do your own thing. But we want to make the, that space that we create is intentional and is put there for a reason. And, and that is a spot that the students want to go to and want to congregate around and actually have and create experience, right? And so um, it's all the all the things we've come to, to love. And like Julie said, if a student has it in their dorm or the weird house they're renting down off, across campus, they're assuming their technology budget and their <laughs> their fees are going to cover the base of line of that when they come to campus, no matter where they go. If they can walk up and, and come in and fall out of their bed and they have Wi-Fi, wherever they can fall into on campus needs to have that same level of infrastructure. Softar put some interesting job description um, suggestions. Would he, would he like to speak them out? I, I... Hi, Jean. Um, so I would say that, as we've all discussed, access to Wi-Fi and power, light, uh, power outlets are really the foundation of such a space because it won't operate without those. Access to daylight in all of our work with students is prime, prime importance. Comfortable furniture, not the furniture we think is comfortable, what, what students consider to be comfortable. Um, Variety of sense of enclosure and openness because there are different comforts levels based, based on individual preferences about how many people it makes sense to gather with. Um, and access to food is critical. So one thing that was brought up in there, um, sound becomes very important in the controlling of that sound in these environments, right? And it, to think we can take a big concrete box and just divide it up with a bunch of chairs and Wi-Fi in there, it's going to become really unruly to actually have any kind of coherent thought in that space when you have 25 different conversations going on. So we really need to understand there's sound treatment needs to come into this and it can't just be the big open box scenario. Yeah, and I, I know, Mark, from, from that standpoint, when, when I've done informal learning spaces in the past, informal spaces in general, the idea is, well, those are always going to be for kind of local content, for local discussion, because like you said, we can't manage that sound, which is 
absolutely required more so than video, despite the name. It's the audio that's important for doing any sort of, of remote connectivity. If I have one person calling in or 10 people calling in, if I'm, if I'm the one person at the learning space calling to 10 other people, or there's 10 of us there and one person calling in, we need to be able to see and hear them and they need to be able to see and hear us as well. But if you have several of these spaces scattered around the commons of the, the say the, the lobby floor of your, of your uh, uh, university uh, student union, well, it's a big space, it's lots of hard surfaces, it's gonna sound terrible. Uh, my conversation is going to bleed right into your conversation, even if it's 30 feet away. We can treat some of the spaces, but we'll have to start looking at adding that capability, providing with beam forming microphones and ideally with maybe some some direct sound speakers to try to ratchet that in. We'd, we'd love to say everyone's going to put on a headset, but we know darn well that'll never happen. Uh, we'd like to say, oh, everyone will connect their Bluetooth. To sit. No, that's not going to work either. So we have to provide some capability for remote co connectivity at these informal learning spaces in less than ideal environments, generally because they're traditional buildings that were all built 150 years ago and they look great and they're lovely spaces, but acoustically they're awful. So we can try to treat them as best we can, work with the architects to get something that's going to balance that use of, of space between acoustics and, and aesthetics. So it still looks nice, but still functional, um, but support that sort of connectivity, that sort of, of interactivity in a space that was really never designed for it but again, that's the way students want to operate. They want to pick up their phone. I can hit a button. If I can hit a button on this phone and talk to five people in my WhatsApp group, why can't I do it at, at, at this informal learning space you guys have here? This is terrible. I'm never going to use it again. So that's the sort of feedback we get. And how do we have to adapt to support that? So that's a real challenge. So we haven't heard from Shannon yet. Hi, Shannon. Hey, how are you? Up? We'd love to hear what you have to say. Sure. So I um, shared that with Jeannie's this with Jeannie last week, but I actually just surveyed 150 students and I asked them pretty much this exact question. And I was gonna tell you that the five, the five things that students said was an open place to study with other people, a space with technology, a space with views to the outdoors, a space with natural light and a space with food and drink. So it's um, pretty spot on with what I'm seeing in the chat. Wonderful. And not one thing, right? I think that's the, yeah. you know, there's no one answer. We, I think we're, we, we didn't, it calls out that we need to be responsible in saying that we're not, none of us are talking about one true answer for all spaces in the future. We're, we're all thinking about the mix of spaces and even the mix of technologies and the two may not, um, uh, it's something that's come up Maybe I'll share that article in the Agora essay, right, was getting a bunch of technologists and curriculum designers together and talking about it and, and making clear that many of these things we're talking about in terms of virtual technologies are not a replacement for the campus. You know, they're not going to, there's not going to be uh, the student experience is going to move completely online. It's that we have a new platform upon which we can grow the campus and the student experience. So it's not going to be, oh, it's just like the, the, um, student union only online, it's going to be, you know, we can be in the student union and we can also be having communication with somebody off campus over Slack. And it's that we have this new layer that we can access. Yeah, I would also add that this, uh, the survey that I just shared was actually um, part of last week's discussion around diversity, equity and inclusion and what creates welcoming and exclusive spaces for students. So it's interesting that we're having a completely different conversation around um, technology and virtual environments, but we're starting to co um, come to the same um, design elements in terms of planning um, good learning spaces. I would like to maybe shift the conversation slightly to, we've talked about space in classrooms, we've talked about students, we've talked about informal, but why don't we talk specifically about faculty for a minute? So we, we were being asked, what, what are we gonna keep? But we, we actually had the opportunity to conduct a faculty uh, survey of what do they want to keep? And within our survey, it mentioned that they want to keep a few things as far as the technology. They don't necessarily want to go back to the hybrid high flex model, probably because of the complexities of ensuring that it's a good experience, uh, especially if, if they're in a classroom that we described as we, we retrofitted one, we didn't plan for that. So they said they wanted to keep, they, they wanted to keep that any kind of video component and so what can we do to ensure that they have the ability to create 
quality video, edit the video, learn, how, have the support mechanisms in place. They wanted to keep um, some type of a learning management system and experience for their students, even though if it's not a fully online class. And they also wanted to keep some type of a Zoom experience, and believe it or not, even though we all feel that we, we're on Zoom way too much, but uh, whether it be guest speakers or office hours or some other type of more convenient uh, approach when they're traveling, et cetera. But my question to you all, um, and you all have all a variety of faculty, is that what you're seeing also? And then what does that mean for our space design? Yeah, I think you know, when we saw the, the big shift, and we, I think a lot of folks who may have not had a really good firm footprint in whatever LMS they may have done, there was a lot of homework to do to, to move all that to. And then we, when we talked about that six month, you know, ramp up. Now they're looking at, okay, well, now I've, I've picked my curriculum apart perfectly and I can make better use of these technologies for these elements and these elements. Not It's not all or not. Um, but one thing we're seeing is, um, the request to have flexible classroom space outside the four walls. So it's very similar to the student conversation we're having, but what are we putting there for faculty infrastructure, right? Are, are there teaching systems or technology that makes sense for a, a, a faculty member to go out and have a review session and have access to the same thing the students are asking, and, you know, maybe 10 or 12 students in the hall or somewhere around the corner, just as an extension of the classroom. Um, and then what, what parts of the classroom need to exist in that type of environment as well. Um, but I think the thing that we're seeing and requesting is they don't wanna lose access to the assistance they had online. We're seeing a lot of requests that we had um, keep teaching uh, students that were there as part of the Zoom experience to help onboard and offboard people into their sessions. And we created really good relationships with a lot of faculty and we had student workers there and they don't want to lose access to now that knowledge worker that they had there. And I think we, we do need to keep, be mindful of how are our services aligned with this? It's not just about the stuff, right? And so how are our actual units designed to make sure that we have the FTE and the knowledge to support the faculty and the students with this return? And I think um, it, it's really interesting. I don't know the, the, the real answer to it, but I think there's definitely a desire to have access to knowledge and knowledge workers. And so how do we get that information to them? One thing I think about a lot is the, from the standpoint, specifically of faculty and their teaching, is when you're teaching in your dining room table and you kind of set that all up to be your your temporary teaching space. But a lot of, of faculty did the same thing I did. They got a second monitor, they put that up over here. Now they, they have more flexibility in, in kind of preparing their their course materials for, for delivery. I'm gonna get this over here and I can put this window here and I can see the students over here and I can position this here and I can have my notes over here. They go back into a classroom, which has a, there's a nice big bright projector at the front of the room. You can show one thing. Where's my flexibility in arranging uh, my, my course materials the way I want to? If you think back 10, 15, 20 years, I would lay those out on that, that big table at the front of the room because that's what I'm going to use here. I'm going to get my materials ready and you know, because then I can see things and it's, it's, it makes sense to me. So they've had this ability to kind of work within this kind of modular display system. I don't know. I, I like to call it the digital canvas. I stole that from somebody else. But if they've been doing that for the last year, and Mark, I think you posed this this way a couple of weeks ago, they're going to come back into the classroom and we may have all the nicest bells and whistles we can provide them. We can create the best online communities for students and we can have all these informal virtual spaces. But why can't I teach the way I want to teach now? The space you have doesn't work the way I want it to because now I know how all these systems go. I just saw a comment in the chat. They're now going to have some, faculty's going to have some level of expertise in all these things. They're going to be much better at it than we think they're going to be. And they're going to want to build on that in the, the now back in a traditional space, but leveraging all these new modalities. And they're going to, they're going to feel boxed in in a lot of places. And, and that's going to be a challenge. Yes, in a, in a new oddball space, and Larry, you mentioned this earlier on, you can pick one or two and really do it up nice and give them that flexibility, but you can't do it in all 500 spaces across the board. We can over the next several years, maybe, but it's gonna take that amount of time to get there. So to that question of what are faculty really expecting when they come back on campus, having operated in a very different environment and they're gonna take the everything they've learned and built upon and wanna bring that with them to the, to the, to the classroom 
and be presented with here's a screen and a projector and you know you have 35 students in front of you is that going to carry over because as, as park mentioned early on we're not going to go back to exactly the way it was in 2018 2019 we can build on what we've learned so if we've improved our teaching and learning methodologies with these new technologies and new access to technologies how do we ensure that that then carries forward and they're not met with an immediate roadblock of you can't do that anymore go back to the way it was two years ago uh, i don't have a good answer for it i'm saying that's going to be one of those challenges of, of at the most basic sense how do i kind of arrange my visual teaching space so it makes sense to me but yet also works for students in the room and, and online so, so I, and I think another thing that kind of goes along that same path is we've opened up a lot more communication channels between students to students within the room but also students to faculty teaching there's chat that they can do in the middle of a zoom there's um, slack channels as they're taking notes as a group or whatever and that's something I, I've heard a lot of instructors say they want to keep. They want to keep those channels open because it, some students just feel more comfortable asking their questions through chat or using those tools for whatever way. And we need to find a way of incorporating that through that one screen in a room without it becoming distracting for the rest of the class. I think that there's one anxiety I, I've heard mentioned from faculty is kind of, you know, coming back and, and it looking bad on them that they're not up to speed on technology right away, right? They're very accustomed to their, their device and they're at home, wherever it may be, but in a room with 40 people staring at you and 20 more online, that time that that faculty is not presenting reflects on them. And there, there's a lot of nervousness about having be, to be exposed to new technologies and not having a developmental program to on-ramp them to that technology, to, to assist them through that learning process. And so um, it, we've had people asking out and, they, and we don't know whose job it really is. And it, it kind of sits in this really weird gray area. It's like we have mechanics and we have kind of the CTL faculty engagement folks, and it's right in between those two realms. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for you know, engaging relationships across campus on that to make sure that they are prepared when they come back. And so um, we're, you know, trying to get really creative is where, where do people come in actually and test drive these things to, to get that experience and, and, and have some success day one. So I, I wanted to call out something that really resonates with me. You know, we talk about learning spaces and the design of them. Um, and that rule book or formula book, um, I think, 20 years ago was really kind of the approach of the architect and the academic, you know, curriculum designer, and they were just coming together. And that's when you start to saw, see, it was more than 20 years ago, the growth of the active learning. I think what you're talking about is another moment of change and in change management, there's new stakeholders that need to be part of the conversation. So you know, that, that the design of these spaces in the future, it's not just so much that you need to build the classroom with the technology in it, that we need to be thinking about how we're supporting the use, the adoption, um, and, and there's new voices that need to be at the table. Yeah, I think some of this even comes down at the registrar level of our universities, right? Sometimes they're totally disconnected. They just need to get, I get, I get 200 students in this room and right. faculty, you're doing it, go. And so that, that creates high levels of anxiety. It's like some faculty, they don't even know what to call their class. They don't want to be binary. It's this or it's this. Like I want to use a little bit of Zoom one day. I want to use this someday. So where are the spaces that match my modality? But the registrar says, I need to go here. My department says I have to go here. Can I do that in there? Is there, a, do we have it listed well? And I think Julie, what you've kind of done with this class criteria piece, like that's our, our step that every university needs to really start look at is break it down. Where do, where can I be effective with how I want to teach, right? And we can't offer everything everywhere. It's not going to scale correctly. So, um, but a lot of registrar departments, they, they're just not really prepared to take that level of granularity on yet. So they need to be at this table and say, this is what works well in these types of spaces. They are classified as this. So make sure it's built into your curriculum as such. Uh, so I, there's so much opportunity here to have a, a larger scale conversation as people return back to campus. People that don't even know they're at the table are at the table. <laughs> they're here. Right. So we're right. running out of time. So I have one last question that I would like to, to, um, to portray to the entire group. So we talked about prototyping and we talked about what's next. So if you had the opportunity to design and develop and prototype a future space to help inform you moving forward, 
what would that be? What would be included and why? What do you want to explore and why? Please tell me I didn't stump everyone with that. I, I'm happy to throw in, but I'm, I, okay. I, I, my interest is, and there's a project going right now that um, is, is doing exactly this, is, is, is this idea of kind of isolating and extracting content uh, from the, that kind of that, that, that teaching stream and letting students be in charge of what they're seeing. Um, that's not something that scales and, and we've seen comments in the chat about, you know, that does create some inequity because this room will do that and that room won't. And that makes it a real challenge. But I think that's going to be a model moving forward. I can do that in Zoom right now. So why can't I, when I'm in a space, do that same thing and let students um, uh, be in charge of what they're viewing at any given time? The challenge with that, of course, is that means, and Larry, you mentioned this early on, you need a much larger and much more complex software and, and hardware delivery system to do that, which means it costs that much more money. So um, it's it's not something that's going to be everywhere, but I think we're going to start to see things like that. I know, Mark, you've built one. We're, we're building one at IU right now uh, that that will do that in, in limited capacity. But I think that's definitely going to be a component of future learning spaces. That will be an accepted kind of given in a space five or 10 years from now that I can show six different things and students can pick which one they're looking at at any given time. And just remember when we prototype doesn't mean we necessarily have to study things at scale. We learn from studying something that perhaps a portion of it will scale and a portion of it will be something specialized. So never not um, move forward with something you want to experiment with just because you know it will never be at, in every classroom. I think personally, I love active learning spaces. I love everything about them. But as we've moved to this high flex environment, the easy answer is always, well, you put the, vir the virtual people in one group and you put the people in the class in another group. And that just doesn't feel right to me. And so if I could, you know, have my sandbox and create my learning room, my learning space, I want an active learning room where virtual members can be part of physical groups and it's just a more equal experience for everybody within the space yeah I, um shannon just put in a good thing about augmented active learning room um and i, I think it's kind of a, an interesting concept it, it's like again getting at that how do we have this equitable sense of the shoulder to shoulder um, I think also I'm as an educator, I, I do also teach and um, there's a lot of these things that we jokingly call sort of black market indicators, you know, black market communication and passing notes is turned into WhatsApp and I'm kind of cool with that. Um, one of those versions is multidisciplinary teams, some people are in the room, some people are not and suddenly they're opening up Google Docs. And, and the new act of learning may be instead of we're all huddled around the digital campfire that we are all huddled shoulder to shoulder virtually and physically jamming on the same document. And now suddenly that's almost a low tech perspective, right? It's a cloud instead of getting a screen and computer lab sort of configuration redone. Um, these are tools that the students will be using to succeed in their you know, professional careers. And so I, I have come to embrace or reconsider that. That may be a good example of how this moves in the forward and it doesn't always have to be expensive screens on the wall. We're at a pivotal point in learning space design. Uh, we, we more than ever were on the forefront of needing to listen to what the faculty have to say. They have new skills. Those spaces have to address this. We have new expectations from our students and our spaces need to address that. Mark, do you have any um, final words? Uh, for once, I'm going to reserve that. I think I'd like to hear what else is in you pulled it together brilliantly. Thank you, Julie. My final kind of thoughts on it is don't think that we have to hold and design everything and be the gatekeepers of what's going to happen. Um, a lot of solutions are going to come forward as low friction and the students are going to adopt them. Faculty are going to adopt them. Um, I think, you know, some of our flexibility is going to be in how we assist them to to think about how they're making these tools work and these solutions. And it, it may not be radical. It may be very simple, elegant things that they come to the table with to solve these solutions. Uh, and, in, and some of our 
our, our redesign may be just kind of what it is we support and what we don't support. And maybe the things we would have classically said no to, we have to revisit, right? And kind of, and if that means changing the, our configuration to spaces or, can, or changing what it is our, our centralized services may be, uh, I think we should be very mindful and allow people to try things as they come back because we're all trying to find innovative approaches to, to solve solutions and to problems and this is our opportunity. Yeah, I think one of the exciting aspects of this entire time is that students are really driving a lot of this change that we're, you know, I, I, some of the examples we had used about students sitting in auditoriums, sharing Google docs as they listen to a lecture and that virtual active learning session there, it's going to be up to us to monitor that and try to figure out what they're using, how they're learning and adapt to that within the next year. I think the other aspect to keep in mind is that we're going to get a lot of strange requests or things that's, let me rephrase, requests that seem strange on, on, their, on the face of it, but make perfect sense when considering that we've been going through some very strange times in the last year and a half. So uh, it's going to be a real challenge to not say no, and I mean that in the nicest way possible from the standpoint of here's the services we can provide. Can we make this work for you? And someone's going to say, but I need this. How do we include that into the larger concept of this learning space. And, and Mark, you've mentioned it several times that these are things that traditionally, and in, in I think probably every university, that the online, the virtual learning is a different department than the physical learning space group. But more and more, we're going to have to work together as a cohesive unit uh, to, to create these successful learning spaces of the future, because they're going to all have that component of it in one way, shape, or form, whether I'm teaching in a space and I want to teach online that day, or if I'm teaching online and we're going to use a space on campus next week, there, that's going to be back and forth. That's going to be part of it. And I've seen a lot of discussion in the chat about registrars getting involved in that. <laughs> that's a that's another discussion for another day, but uh, it's going to be a challenge for, from our perspective, from an IT perspective. How do we not say no? How do we say yes? Or how do we find a solution? Because at the end of the day, people want to teach and people want to learn. And, and how do we facilitate that? So we're out of time, but I invite you to write your job description for your next learning space. So think about it with your teams. What does it need? What can, I love that uh, Jeannie uh, challenged us with, what are the characteristics if you were going to hire a learning space? Uh, so um, take the next couple of minutes, but it's been a pleasure. I, I appreciate being asked to moderate. I, uh, I love um, this community of learners and we're all, we all are um, so passionate about what we do and it's um, fantastic and fun to, to hear from all of you and everything that you're working on. Good luck. Um, we, we have some new challenges, but I think if we all um, lean on each other, we can all be successful.